Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. It's spooky time. It's the witching hour at the <laughs> Edgewater Beach Hotel. The witching hour, huh? <laughs> Witches are not real, and haunted hotels are not real, and spooky probably isn't spooky, even... Spooky. Things can real. be spooky. That's there. We've discovered one out of three for reality. All right. My name is Eric. I'm here with Michael Kester. Yeah. And uh, we're going to discover some camp from some enthusiasts today. Oh, man. We're going to talk about... Uh, I'm just, I'm really excited for this show. We're going to talk about people who are fucking dedicated to their craft. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is one movie that I hadn't seen that is my favorite thing ever. And one movie that I hadn't seen that is my favorite thing ever. Oh, this is great. This is Back like if the... anything from year one ever worked the yep. way that we wanted. Right. It would be this show today. Oh, that's great because I'd seen the other. Oh, uh-huh. so good. Um, what are we doing today? Today we are doing the Chiodo Brothers Killer Clowns from Outer Space and our good friend Herschel Gordon Lewis's Blood Feast 2. And we are going to spoil them. That's how we roll in Chicago. We spoil the films. We spoil everything. It's all over. Spoilers. From- we spoil we'll- LA for New Yorkers. We spoil we'll- New York for people from LA. We'll try and just spoil these two films. Okay, I don't know fine. that we need to do any of that other stuff. All right. We only have 40 something minutes. I mean, it's we can't not- spoil the whole city. <laughs> Yeah, well, in five years, we've already spoiled the internet, I think. That's true. All right, so use the chapters to skip the spoilers. You can, uh, we're going to do Killer Clowns from Outer Space first. And if you haven't seen that movie, and you should, you can skip it and go to Blood Feast 2, which you also haven't seen. It may or may not be on Netflix, because that seems to It's on go... YouTube. Is it on YouTube? It's on YouTube. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, it goes on and off Netflix every other fucking day, so I don't know what's happening over there. But uh, if you can't see that, then listen to it or skip it, or you know what? You are a free-roaming operator. You do whatever the fuck you please. Let's start with Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Oh, God, thank you. 1988, and the these brother. Who is this? The Chiodo Brothers. This is the only thing they've ever definitively done that can have their fucking name on it. Why is that? I don't know why. You can't put their name on Team America? We they, did that. I mean, we didn't mention them at they all. They didn't but... make Team America. Sure. There Matt are and Trey, names. Different if you brothers. Look at, if you look at the things that the Chiodo brothers have done, aside from Killer Clowns, you look at Team America, you don't think the Chiodo brothers, Team America. You think right. Matt and Trey Parker's Team America. I World think Police. excuse to invoke South Park again on our show. Right. Cha-ching. If you look at Ernest Scared Stupid, you don't think the Chiodo brothers, Ernest Scared Stupid. Sure. You think another Jim Varney hilarious sure. comedy vehicle. We're doing all the Ernest on a Laugh-A-Palooza oh coming my God, it's year not, six. No, that's not a thing that's going to happen. <laughs> what do you know now? Also, speaking of another Palooza, or shouldn't I? I probably shouldn't, should I? No, Never mind, too late pretend now. I wasn't speaking of a Palooza, but the Chiodo brothers also did Critters. Uh, is that another Laugh-A-Palooza that you're lining up? <laughs> um, I hate you. What the Chiodo brothers do is creature effects. Oh my god, um, so good. And that's why Killer Clowns is the greatest fucking thing that happened in 1988 for creature effects. No child's play. Oh, damn. But then, right after that, Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Except this is the one that they wrote, produced, directed. They had their hands in every pie in this fucking movie. Yeah. <laughs> can't make a pie joke right um the title song is yeah what i was gonna By, start um, oh what's the band's name oh i don't i don't know who made the title song oh shit i i want to know the name of the band double feature show at gmail.com uh-huh. or i'll just look it up sure no the actual thing i want you to email is what's the name of that big top guitar riff that winds up you know na, the, na, 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 yeah what is that yeah. that's got to have a name yeah, to it, it right who wrote that what is it it's just a bunch of really creepy clown sounds and then title song and incorporation of big top guitar riff. Right. Because there's clowns from outer space. Uh-huh. You get what you paid for. There's clowns from outer space. They yeah, traveled here people. on uh, Halley's Comet, which is not Hale Bop. Can we talk right. about that really quick? I remember Hale Bop from our, from our youth. Okay. <laughs> so 1988, right? Uh, people travel here on a comet. People from our generation, or maybe just people in general, are thinking about Heaven's Gate. Mm-hmm. Heaven's Gate was late 90, 97, uh-huh. uh, Heaven's Gate. 
So this totally, I mean, I don't want to say it predicts Heaven's Gate, but it precedes it. That's for goddamn sure. The Heaven's Gate call were these people who thought there was a spaceship at the uh-huh. end of the comet. And I get Halley's Comet and Hale Bob mixed up all the time. I don't know why. But the Halley's Comet is, uh, there's a bunch of really cool astronomy stuff you can look up. And we'll just already spend 40 minutes on Killer Clowns, so we don't have time to talk about astronomy, although I'd love to. But uh, when the comet lands on Earth, uh-huh. not a thing that actually happens, yep. but a uh, thing that happens in the film they uh there appears to be a big top there's yes. a tent attached yes. and it's the or maybe that is the comet i guess yeah. it's the tent part of the mystery of the mythos of the clowns which we'll get to but it's uh, a hybrid of a fun house and that one scene from the death star yep uh the girl speculates it's a ufo because no one stores cotton candy like this yes I mean, if so, the I'm theme so glad song you picked up on all of these things. Jesus. These are my favorite moments in the early portion of the film. If the theme song wasn't enough for me, Michael, these things are. So I want to talk about the humans first, blah, blah, humans, and then I want to talk about the clowns. Okay. The humans, I mean, we got a bunch of kids. It's a uh, trauma pack, good it, as ever. That's just what we want. The, the, the group that we have that make up it's this It's not film, a trauma pack, by the way, right? I right, don't think no, these people are interested. But it's that little. kind of toxic Avengers. Sure. Everybody's overacting. Right, right. Um, The group that this film puts together, I think, is notable in horror cinema for the reason that nobody in this film, not one person, Mm -hmm. is even partially a parallel to a real-life human being. Sure. Everyone in this film is not a real person. The girl's not real. The main antagonist is not real. The ice cream brothers aren't real. Ice that cream fucking brothers. cop who refuses to accept that oh. there are clowns. Sure. Not a real person. Well, I love the dynamic of the two cops. Yeah. So this is sort of your two types of skepticism. Yeah. You know, you have, um, and I mean, they're both just done poorly because everybody's a buffoon in this movie. And that's the point. But you have the older cop who is the skeptical police officer who's made a fool of because he, you know, he turns out to be wrong. And that happens so very often to skeptics in these movies. They are movies because something fantastical happens in them. And that makes the skeptics look like buffoons all the time. We've talked about that uh, for better or for worse in The Last Exorcism and uh, The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Right. Uh, anything else that had exorcism in it. We have kind of talked about the treatment of different times when skeptics win, skeptics change their mind. How far does the evidence need to go before you accept that you're in a world where this crazy shit happens? But he dismisses things out of hand. So if we're to look at these two guys as different types of skepticism, he's the pragmatic skepticism. He goes, yeah, we could investigate this or whatever, but we all know Bigfoot's not real. You guys are full of it. You know, armchair dismissal. He also sees into, I mean, he thinks uh, everybody's trying to get him fired when yeah. the evidence starts pouring in. Right. So he's got that block there. He starts out not being very open-minded, but being dismissive, being pragmatic, if we wanted to put it in a light way. Uh-huh. But then we have the younger cop. And the younger cop is, I mean, the one who wins out. He's more the side of uh, inquiry. He's that kind of inquisitive skepticism where you go, no, I'm going to really get out there and Joe Nickel this fucking thing. I'm going to accept that, yeah, there's probably no Bigfoot, but why don't we poke around and see if there's any killer clowns from outer space? Sure. How would you ta- it's It's kind of the more fun version of skepticism. Mm-hmm. Let's pretend for a moment. Sure. There are killer clowns from outer space. Well- how could we test this? How do you prove yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, once a hypothesis is is given up, if they're assume it's 1988 and there's no sure. Google, sure, you can't just go. This is officially not a real thing, right? You have to we get find back to evidence. Hashtag not a thing. Look at that. I'm sorry. <laughs> you have to find evidence. Sure. For anything, that's part right. of the rules of being a skeptic. Is sure. If there is no evidence, then fuck you, you're wrong. <laughs> right. But if you don't look for evidence, then fuck you, you're ignorant. Yeah, yeah, certainly. So that inquiry is, I mean, you set up a hypothesis and you uh, you look for things. Which in this case is not just killer clowns. Sure. But they are from 
outer space. And uh, I will admit to, I mean, we all do. We are pragmatic skeptics because we have fucking, we have a show to do. Yeah. We have things to go do. You know, we can't be investigating every insane claim people make. We don't even do a very good job of that on our show. Yeah, not even a little. Things come up and we just go, no, that's bullshit. No, that thing over there doesn't exist. Move yeah. on. Check the internet. We don't have time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. Sorry, let's talk about clowns. Why are we talking about skepticism? I want to talk about clowns. Oh my God, Eric, the clowns. They're, um, eat, they're, they're stinging. They're eating my face. <laughs> the, you're getting uh, dangerously close to Troll 2. They're eating her and then they're going to eat me. Oh my God. Oh God, Troll 2. The shadow play and the... When I think about the, the long, long list of why these clowns are the best thing ever. The only question that rises is why no sequel? <laughs> That's, yeah, actually. Another, uh, we talked yeah. about Fright Night last week. Yeah. Uh, but this, honestly, more than Fright Night, I feel like is the, it's the no, biggest right. travesty. This, Killer this Clowns from Outer Space for a franchise. should have been 10 sequels. Although the Chiodo Brothers have announced that they're planning a sequel. Well, yeah, but they've but, been announcing I mean, that for a long there time. There should have been seven, right? I'm, we should have already had Jason versus the Clowns at this point. It's almost a suspiciously perfect start to a non-existent franchise. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. I don't know why there isn't. It's not even, I mean, this one was outstanding. Yeah. I don't even know why. All right, but that aside, the first thing about the Clowns, um, that shadow play, that's where I was going. It's, uh, there's a couple different ways they do it. And this starts to get into all the effects. Mm -hmm. You got the, the human walking by the tent with the shadow of the clown. Mm -hmm. And this is something we're going to see through the whole movie. Here is a simple trick where the way to accomplish the trick is not hard, but the desired outcome is super awesome. And that is my favorite type of effects. It's the ones we've always championed. So many times filmmakers come at it from the other direction. What's the hardest thing we could do? And what then would once nobody they... expect us to be able to pull off? Well, not even that, but just once we get in the CG room, what's the hardest thing to do? Okay, we did it. And then you look at it and you go, oh, couldn't you just maybe move this around or yeah. shake it? Or, you know, you, you see the end result and you go, that doesn't really look that hard. When we create these giant CG backgrounds and landscapes and, and you go, uh, that didn't have to be done like <laughs> that. You do see the, I mean, you see stuff that happens in practice that's made to look easy. That's where we really, we get back into that magic thing. We get to, uh, you know, Lord of the Rings being shot with all these skewed perspectives. Sure. And you watch it and you just go, oh yeah, I didn't even notice the actors were smaller. Right. And in reality, they're moving around sets and tables the whole time. That's the kind of thing that Killer Clowns is doing, but they're doing the easy work for the incredible outcome. They're just, you know, projecting a shadow. You expect the light direction to come from the other way, so you're seeing a scary clown shadow, and it's kind of subtle, too, especially mm -hmm. for a movie like this. Yeah. For a movie like this, it's incredibly subtle. You're seeing a scary clown shadow, um, regular person. But they play with shadows a lot. There's also that... The hand puppet dinosaur. <laughs> the Yeah, shadow puppet kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is just, I mean, total opposite. That looks like it's probably stop motion or something. Yeah. Where uh, we're just flailing around our hands and all sorts of crazy fucking things are coming up on the wall. It's this kind of theater craft. And I think we talked about that when we talked about um, some of the George Clooney stuff that what was the first george clooney thing we did or one of the early ones the first directed we did, one we did it with uh fight club what was that confessions of a dangerous mind or was it yeah yeah i think that was yeah. right and we talked about uh kind of the different theater things he was doing sure. or lighting different rooms right. putting stuff side by side there are clowns coming out of pizza boxes yeah and that fat valentine's day flower bouquet chocolate mm -hmm. whatever clown and Scary end boss clown. Yeah. I mean, okay, another great example of how they're doing this. You got these giant clowns. They look awesome. They're in big, cumbersome suits. How are we going to make them move around all scary? Well, they're in big, cumbersome suits, so they can move slowly. Oh, yeah, slow is scary. Yeah. Okay, easy, done. But the effects in the end, you know, part of it is great ideas, and part of it is, yeah, Whoops, that's, that's awesome. That's just what works. Yeah. Hey, it turns out we have big, obnoxious, goofy suits. It's hard to run. Oh, yeah. When they move slow, they really are scarier. Yeah. That's where you see the mastery 
one of the places you see the mastery of these brothers and the effects work they're doing. I think that the moment that my mind is 100% blown by mm. the effects work in this film is when popcorn crawls across a floor. Oh, I know. How I know. do they do that? I know. <laughs> well, all that, even when they do get into the more computer oriented or the, uh, you know, the tricks of starting and stopping the camera and projecting things. That stuff looks good because they've built their own reputation in this yeah. movie. When they can just throw popcorn down a hallway, I mean, any other movie would be blowing the popcorn through some kind of computer animated or some bad floating wire rigged. I mean, this is literally just, well, if we cut it, it's almost Robert Rodriguez style. Yeah. If we just cut this really quick, I bet we could get away with just tossing a handful of popcorn cut it it's you know the scene lasts less than a second there's another angle throwing popcorn further down the hey why don't we make it a circular hallway no one will even notice Ugh, it's brilliant yeah. it's great the way the clowns look too are i mean you expect killer clowns from outer space it's going to be goofy it's going to uh -huh. be kind of silly and i don't want to start getting to a point where i go wow they're genuinely scary but they are a little, they're a little terrifying. Pretty, they're pretty creepy. They're at the very least incredibly well designed. Yeah. I mean. Well, it's because they're functional. Their faces sure. move. They have enough facial motion to give them the air of actually being alive. Right. But not enough facial motion to give them the air of being human. Your brain knows there's a person in the suit, but never for a second do you see a person in a suit. Right. You see, oh, that's just, I mean, you can't look in there and go, there's where the eye holes are. Sure. Everything just blends so well. The, uh, I think the, the moment where it gets closest to being scary is that the clown rising out of the puppet show. And that's another one where they're playing with a lot of, all right, so this guy's watching a puppet show. It's two tiny little puppets. And mentally, as the audience member of a puppet show, you have agreed to participate in fantasy. You or I go to see a puppet show, or we watch Bing John Malkovich, and we know that there is someone pulling the strings. Uh -huh. we know pulling the string, yeah, got it. Yeah, right, or we watch Ed Wood. We know that Plan 9 style, oh, that wasn't even Plan 9, that was Glenn or Glenda, wasn't yeah. it? God, Glenn or fucking Glenda. Um, there's a dude under there. And he's moving stuff around. These aren't even pulling the strings. This is hand puppets. Yeah. It's a fucking sock puppet. So there's a guy uh, underneath there. But you watch a puppet show, and although you know that, there's a man in the suit, there's a guy under the table, your brain shuts it off. You agree to participate in fantasy. You think there's no person controlling the puppets, because that's what you have to think. And so in this scene, when the puppets rise up from the stage and there is a clown holding them, part of it is scary because I think mentally it's making you break your self-deceit. Right. You're going, oh, I thought we were all part, we weren't talking about the part where there's a, and then also it's just a scary clown. It is too. a scary clown. It plays on a unspoken mental agreement, and there's a scary clown. <laughs> Thank you, creators of the film. But you know, much like we talked about in Coraline, it's also a movie that it keeps outdoing itself with how creative it is. Yeah. Coraline's always going to be my go-to uh, when I remember back to us thinking about stuff. But anytime there's stop motion or even Mirror Mask had a lot of that where every single object in Mirror Mask is something somebody created. Uh, with the exception, I guess, of the real world stuff. But that's especially true in Coraline. Yeah. Someone handmade every object. They all have distinct character. And I don't mean that necessarily so much visually in this movie, but... In the inventive ideas, it seems like, again, to go back to Coraline, where we get to kind of third act, movie should just be doing what it's set up by now, but we're going to just introduce another world and more designs. That's totally what Killer Clowns oh, does. Yeah. It gets to the end, and we're still, we still have fresh ideas three sure. minutes before the movie's There's over. There's the vacuum on the street, which is yeah. really one of the more eerie moments. It's kind of got a village of the dam feel where mm -hmm. you just... Whenever I see some something walking down the street in a big group in a deserted suburban kind of right. bunch of homes, right. it's really scary because the town is it's succumbed to these terrifying things. Yeah. I mean, every once in a while, I have to snap into it and point. go, oh, yeah, the clowns are invading the town. That's what they're doing. 
because I get so caught up in the filmmaking. I get so caught up in, you know, there's just more gags and more creatures and tentacle creatures. Mm-hmm. Tentacle creatures. Yeah. Just come from out of nowhere. We don't have to do that and now. And boss tentacle creatures. That's, in yeah, the right? The clowns start using human voices. It's a trick they can do, you know, or Debbie gets in the, the giant fucking balloon thing. Um, new, 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 new. Just a million new ideas. It's uh, an hour into the movie before we even get our first pie joke. Yeah. I mean, you would assume, I don't know, maybe, and I don't want to get cynical and go, ah, movies are just lazy. But if I create a movie uh, called Killer Clowns from Outer Space, I think, haha, that movie writes itself, work's done, let's make more films. Yeah. But they really stick with it. They don't just go, okay, well, what, we could do a pie joke. Anybody got anything else? Pie, seltzer I mean, water, just, clown car, It's as if it. they were born to do this, sure. and they really, the ideas are just pouring out of them. You know, it's their baby. And that's not even enough. They get to origin speculation. Yeah. You know, that was the thing I kind of hinted at earlier, but they, uh, when they're, they don't have time or money to show more visual ideas they get into well let's explore the background of the clowns a bit not just so we could check that off a list and say oh we we address that no one will complain about it but it's really i mean they have solid ideas this is an ancient you know astronaut civilization or our idea of clowns on planet earth might come from them Uh uh-huh you know, the uh, the kind of legend idea of ancient astronaut. I mean, that's crazy to me that they would choose to just verbally invoke that towards the end of the movie. Just keep the creativity coming, I guess. It makes the audience yeah. more creative. It's things where you can kind of play with those ideas in your head. It's the thing that makes you talk about the movie later. When I say something like makes the audience more creative, that's what I'm getting at, is you and I can then go out to get something ridiculous like pie after the movie and go, yeah, well, where do the clowns come from? Hold on a second. Let's actually talk (laughs) about where they do our idea of clowns come from them. Just one more way to go. Hey, we have a, you know, we have a couple more ideas too. Yeah. Part of me knew we were never done with Herschel Gordon Lewis. Yeah. Part of me deep inside or on the surface as we were recording the last HGL show. Yeah. Uh, who really quick? Who is Herschel Gordon Lewis? Herschel Gordon Lewis is the godfather of gore. He invented. Um, wow, you're just gonna throw man. That's it. How things have changed since year one of uh, Double Feature. He invented the. Are you ready to call Psycho the first slasher film Fuck yet? No. He okay. invented. <laughs> just checking on you, man. The idea of so Double Feature, we love exploitation. That's a thing we like. Herschel Gordon Lewis was really the first filmmaker to consistently exploit violence sure. through bloody, gory organs coming out of bodies. I thought that was the Gore Gore Girls. That's Herschel Gordon Lewis. I thought that was the gruesome twosome. Oh, yeah, that's him, too. It's either Herschel Gordon Lewis or Alice Cooper and Rob Zombie. Oh, yeah, there you it's go. It's one or the other. But not Rob Zombie on his faithful color chart? No, I'm sorry. That joke was on the high end of the low. So we did Gorgo Girls, and we did Blood Feast. We did do Blood Feast. Uh, as well, we talked about Twice. <laughs> uh, it on the Music Box Massacre. And did we do an extra show with Blood Feast? I think we did. Yeah, we did, didn't yeah. we? Yeah, when we were wrapping all our Argento uh, stuff to, well, more Argento on the show. We'll get it. Sidetracked. Um, Herschel Gordon Lewis is this guy who- He's a shy town boy. He, yeah, and he took a break from writing films for decades. Forever. <laughs> and then came back and did this one. Right. Holy crap. So what this does and what this is to me is the definitive moment where an old filmmaker who's now a thousand years old Mm. comes out of retirement, does a film, and you go, okay, this is either going to be terribly contrived because he's cashing in. Right, making a sequel to his previous. Or it's going to be the moment where everything that was coming out in the 70s, which I can't fully understand because I was born in the 80s. Mm. This will be the first film that comes out in my time and I can see it for what it is now. Yeah. You could see it in a theater, hypothetically. You could not do that. Well, because when you look at a film in the 70s, you or I have a really difficult time being able to judge it in the wider scope of cinema at the time. We've seen a lot of films from the 70s, but something that's coming out in a grindhouse theater, Mm. we're not sure what level of humor is right. in the film or what is funny because it's 1974 and that's a hilarious thing because we live in the present and that would never happen. 
It's almost like we talked about on the eye, the cultural thing. Sure. We're not sure what it actually right. means in China. Uh, so when it comes here, we're not really sure how to perceive that. So one of the most wonderful and self-affirming things about Blood Feast 2 is that it's hilarious on purpose. Yeah. That and that's when I get to go yeah. and say, okay, so while I was laughing at the Gorgor girls, it's because Herschel Gordon Lewis is making violent comedies yeah, yeah. and not because he's making bad horror movies. Well, and the other thing is the seventies movies were, they look like they were from the seventies. So does this. Yeah. And I want to talk about <laughs> that. When I first saw, saw it with you, actually, we were at music box. Yeah. Um, first saw, Blood Feast, the original Blood Feast, I was in love with it. That tinted 70s style, it was this awakening about Grindhouse for me. Yeah. Oh, I thought I just kind of dug that Grindhouse style, but I want to see things specifically with gore from this director, from the tinted like this, yeah. and low budget, and it just really, uh, I don't know, it, it fucking spoke to me or something. Yeah. But, you know, then you see these things, and... It wasn't until I saw a bunch of them that I honestly could understand the content. You know, I probably saw six Herschel Gordon Lewis movies before I got what they were about. I just kept going, yeah, it's, it's tinted weird and everybody sucks. That's, <laughs> that's, these people don't know how to act. And, and then I kind of started getting his sense of uh humor and perversion mm -hmm. and why he was making film and sure. then we talked about it on the show you know he wrote these books and this is not his day job and, right you know everything that's funny about that but now we get this movie which by the way he comes back and works with david friedman on uh -huh. which is the best fucking thing 30 years later or it's uh i guess 2002 when he made this david friedman's still on the bill won't make a film without him um it's widescreen yeah. And it's properly exposed. And so we compensate by starting in an alley dumpster. We're yeah. right back to it. And I worried the first time I saw it that maybe it was the 70s tint. Maybe that's what I liked. And maybe it's not going to work now. And then the fucking second we get the red under the door yeah. and the organ, I am excited. I am right there. The two guys go nuts. One pulls his own guts yeah. out. The stupid fucking drum that happens. And then the title music. That's where it's at. I think the thing that blows my mind about Herschel Gordon Lewis and Blood Feast 2 is that you and I have done Martyrs on the show. I mean, I've seen all the Human Centipede movies. I've sure. seen a Serbian <laughs> sure. film. People tell me X film is the most fucked up film I've ever seen. Irreversible. Sure. I will go out of my way to see it. And... Odds are I'll probably be able to jerk off to it without feeling guilty. <laughs> right. Um, right. Blood Feast 2, there are scenes that I have to look away from. Sure. There are moments where I watch the film and I scold Herschel Gordon Lewis for being sure. such a dirty man. But you know what it is, is you can't jerk off to it because it's someone else's pornography. That's, That's true. That's what's going on here. Well, when I see that fucking corkscrew I know, in, in the, the ear, ear, I know. I just want to go home. I mean, I know. I'm done at that point. <laughs> I'm a little bit queasy and I'm kind of angry because it was prefaced with a lingerie party. Right. And right. I go, oh, we're all having a right. good time. Oh, right. why is that? Oh, come on, Herschel. Right. Come on. <laughs> right. I had a good thing going. <laughs> yeah. The arm scene with the grinder and the Ugh. screwing. And it's the... so fucking gross. Oh, my God. It's just, it's, it's disgusting. It is. It's disgusting. The music keeps it, I mean, it keeps it fun, but it's still intense. Can you imagine us? Okay, so... Think back to, think to that arm scene. I will. Going in the grinder. If there's no music in there, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just so it's uncomfortable the worst to watch. Thing. It's only because I can kind of giggle with it and think about Herschel Gordon Lewis. If I couldn't imagine him making this film, I would be, uh, get me out of it. But you know, you're kind of right. Then the maggots come in that yeah. scene and, and that is the point where I go, you know, well, it's not in that scene. It's later. Sure. Uh, this was bad enough when we were losing the arms. Maggots might be too much. Yeah, gouging out the ear, and but then sometimes you get a a super fake torso that's being yeah. ripped open, and and I guess there was a moment when we start taking all the parts out that I had to go. Oh, uh, this is a movie. They were making a movie here. Yeah, because the the tone of the movie is just oh, we're having fun. Everybody likes filmmaking. Look at all these actors. Everybody's having a wild time, and they're just. They're relentlessly pouring guts out of this yeah. torso. 
And they're organs. I don't know yeah, what or- I know. I don't know whose know. or what organs they be, are. Yeah. But they're not. It's that's butcher not, shop, right? Yeah. It ha- I'm sure that's not some Chiodo magic. Were that's this a movie liver. more famous or older, we would look on the internet and it would tell us that they got them from a cadaver or a butcher shop. Yep. But this falls uh, well in the realm of no one's seen or talked about this movie. So that stuff we get, and it has that impact, and it's still there all this time later. And I love that. What's noticeably different, I is, think, is, is the actor playing Fu Hadrahemses. The acting in general is, and maybe it's because it's modern, but I've never felt like it was so clear what it was doing. Agreed. And it's it's this bizarre thing. I don't know what you make of it. You know, it's okay. um. I mean, what I watched this, and I can see the actors having fun with it. Yeah, and some of them almost can't hold back from laughing as they're doing. It almost seems to me like if somebody made a Herschel Gordon Lewis play today yeah. based on one of the, they would all get the kitsch and the 70s and what it was, except that I watch this and it it's enlightening. I go, oh, Herschel Gordon Lewis didn't make a bunch of movies in the 70s and now he's making fun of himself. This is what he was always doing. Yeah. They were always holding back laughing. Mm-hmm. They were always delivering these I look back to the I look back to the detective in Gorgor Girls. Yeah, absolutely. That's the guy that I can use as a crutch to then look at the acting in this film. Sure. And go, everybody is fucking around. Yeah, everybody's fucking around. You're right. That's the acting style. Everybody's fucking around. The women are, the secretary is... Uh, John fucking what's his name? Spud, Spud. McConnell. Yeah, yeah, is mess. The sheriff. He's, he's probably the only actual actor. He's film, the only. Right? If you Are go there... to the Wikipedia page, he's the only person that you can click through. He was in something we did. He, he was in like uh, Oh Brother Where Art Thou. That seems familiar. I don't know if he wasn't eating. I won't recognize him. Sure, right. Well, and he has some of the best. I mean, just okay. So both of the cops, uh-huh. both the oh, detectives. The cops. Including the one that wears a lot of eyeliner. Oh my god! You really like the other cop too, though. I yeah, the fucking the fucking detective cop sheriff whatever. Sure. The one who for I, I I'm guessing this is just an acting choice, where he <laughs> said going into this film, you know what's going to be awesome if I end every scene by shouting my last line. Oh, I haven't noticed. Even this. though it doesn't matter. Oh my god! I can't wait to because watch it again. He comes into a scene. And he's all fired up and he's angry yeah. and he's got all this stuff to say. But before the scene ends, the last thing he says always is shouted and he pounds on something. Sure, sure. Even though he's sufficiently calmed down. Right. Uh, it, it's completely out of context, but that has pissed him off. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, his performance is great. Maybe it's the other cop I look to because he's the one that's going to get things done around sure. here. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's the uh, what does he say? Look for the obvious or whatever. He's talking about how it's spite. He's Occam's razor. Occam's razor. He's uh, spouses, relatives, uh-huh. and then he gives the fucking weather, which that is just is so the good. weirdest. It's, what the hell is going on? That's in that the moment scene? where I understood the film. Yeah, is right. I go, right. okay, it's funny on purpose. Yeah, that's a joke. That's well, a legitimate joke. And later, another scene like that comes up in the same office where the secretary gets the mood lighting. Uh huh. And we're almost doing Gorgo Girls again. I love uh, the secretary does all the work around yeah. there too. Especially in a movie that, you know, is in a genre that people say disrespects women all the time. That's film. It's Well, that's true too. But I mean, that's been true of Herschel's other stuff. Yeah. Think about our floozy in Gorgo Girls, uh-huh. right? Uh, but now that we can really see that the actors are, as you say, fucking around... We get a chance to, I mean, he changes up the roles of the women. The women in this movie are, especially the ones in roles of authority, are great. They're getting everything done and they're talking down to the cops Uh and they know, you know, they know what's going on. I guess with the exception of the party of girls, who are just having a party, not every woman needs to run around kicking ass. But they all have stripper names that writes them off sure. as needing to be anything more than two dimensional. Sure, right. I feel like every woman in the film is at a level of average Herschel Gordon Lewis character, just lives in the town, or much higher. Yeah. All the way up to the secretary who I feel maybe the smart or the the beat cop woman. Sure. Who may be the smartest people, you know, in the entire film. So that that proper exposure thing I was talking about earlier where the films in widescreen and stuff, that doesn't yeah. last very long. 
it's always in widescreen, but as far as properly exposed or knows what he's doing with the camera, I mean, I don't know. I do feel like Herschel Gordon Lewis is getting better. Yeah. I feel like whatever he did for 30 years, he made some nudie cutie movies at home that he didn't show anybody. And, or we're just going to see for the next hundred years, Herschel Gordon Lewis movies come out every year. He's stockpiling them. Uh He's made his movies in a block schedule, but it's good to see that. I mean, rock and lingerie party and watching the girl get out of the shower, the same things this many years later still get Herschel Gordon Lewis off. Yeah. It hasn't changed a bit. His fetishes are all the same. He likes the same teasy, you know, I love the scene of the girl. She showers and the camera's just planted there mm-hmm. because much like Russ Meyer, this is pornography for yep. him. He's sitting here and he's, although, as we've talked about, Russ Meyer would hate me for that. But uh, this is him having fun, let's say, yep. on the set, doing what he thinks is the right thing, mm-hmm. enjoying his job. He forgets that the camera's running. He's just, oh yeah, people will watch a 10-minute scene of a girl sure. showering where you can right. see nothing. But the best part is... She finishes the shower and she reaches for uh, what I'll call the towel of greater disappointment. Sure. Yeah, what they get in movies where a steamy shower covered all the bits, reach for the towel, wrap it around. Yeah. And I know, yeah, she doesn't quite. Doesn't use it to cover her chest at all. (laughs) The frame could cover the bottom half of her, but uh, no, just wraps it around or walks down some stairs. It's just good to see him getting off of the same thing. Oh, I love that. It's awesome. I love that the same, uh, making the same movie is still exciting for him because it's still exciting for me. I mean, that's, that's yeah. what it comes down to. It's not only still exciting, but retroactively it goes back and it makes me understand the previous things. Uh-huh. It's like you were saying, I can get behind more of that stuff now knowing where he was coming from and being able to watch that stuff feeling more informed like that, it almost gives it another layer. Sure. The humor element especially is, I mean, you hear those Herschel Gordon Lewis one-liners uh, dropping hints like Navy men dropping soap or whatever. Uh-huh. It's Or the daddy issues joke. Right. With the, yeah. With the other cop. Um, John Waters is the best one. And Ugh. why don't we just make John Waters define this then? But when you're doing a study of Herschel Gordon Lewis and you need to understand what he thinks is a joke, this is definitively it. John Waters likes Herschel Gordon Lewis, the reason you know there's something to that in the first place. Mm -hmm. John Waters, mastery of filmmaking himself, probably making films in much the same way. Yeah, he said that Blood Feast is one of his favorite movies of all time. Oh, that's great. When we were talking Pink Flamingos, I mean, that's the kind of Herschel Gordon Lewis, get your friends together, make a goddamn movie. And now, all these years later, these these. Well, one filmmaker has gone down one path and became prolific, and the other one who spent 30 years writing ad copy or something come back together, and he puts John Waters in his movie. John Waters gets him. They get each other. Uh, Now he's writing jokes for John Waters. So good. So you know that the movie thinks this is a joke. John Mm -hmm. Waters thinks he's delivering a joke. Everything, all the pieces could not understand their place more. (laughs) And so what you get is John Waters, his character marries this couple, which is great in itself. He's the priest. Uh And then he sits at a table and it's almost like he's signing autographs, but he's delivering one-liners. It's a table where you stand in line for John Waters to give you a one-liner. Yeah. It's, I mean, that sounds like an attraction I would pay upwards of $5 for. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely the case. He, uh, you know, he tells the one kid that he should come by more and mm-hmm. then he... asks the kids if they know what hell is. I know. That's the best that one. Is the then best you one. should hang out with priests more. Uh-huh. And the movie cuts away because Herschel Gordon Lewis knows it's a fucking joke. Yep. The whole thing, uh, putting John Waters in there really lets you point at something and go, all right, if this is a big puzzle and everything's fuzzy and I'm trying to pin down who is this guy, what does he think, how does he view his own films, how Uh do audiences receive them, what about the time they were made. This is a great place to start, is to go, well, that's what a joke looks like. Yeah. What else can we figure out from here? Well, if you want to talk about Herschel Gordon Lewis making a joke no one but Herschel Gordon Lewis understands, we have to talk about the bride's father. Oh, sure, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, Uh, the first scene? Yeah, but then subsequently... (laughs) Just in general? 
every scene where he's laying on the floor randomly oh, throughout yeah, the film. Yeah, yeah. Sure, and sure. it doesn't make any goddamn sense why sure. he's there and everybody ignores him. Sure. And you know it's a joke, but you can't understand why it's funny. So that's the other side of yeah. the, uh, the line of jokes. There's one that's very easy to point out and there's, I mean... It's definitely funny on both ends right. of the spectrum. <laughs> right, right. But one is very obvious oh, why it's funny. Oh, my business. I love one. that in the beginning where she goes... Oh, blah, blah, on his business. And he's just looking at the floor the whole time, probably figuring out where he's going to lay down and yeah. take a nap, I guess. <laughs> and then he goes, oh, I have a business. And then just puts his head back down. You're right. It's funny. And I don't get it at all. Yeah. Sometimes things are just funny and you don't have to understand them. That's right. And then sometimes Cartoon Network makes that an entire genre. We have a website, doublefeatureshow.com. Uh, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com would be the email address to send us things. If anybody felt enlightened by Blood Feast 2, we both think Blood Feast 2 is just fucking amazing. Love it. But it's also enlightening. And if you saw it and finally went, oh, I get this now. Because we kind of stopped doing Herschel Gordon Lewis movies. Uh -huh. And, you know, they're, I don't want to say redundant, but maybe redundant to try and analyze on a show. Sure. Like Road Exploitation, for example. Yeah, right. But like Road Exploitation, we will get back to Herschel Gordon Lewis. <laughs> but a lot of people have gone. Oh, God, another one of these. Yep. I don't get Herschel Gordon Lewis. I don't know why you do these. I really hope this is the one for me. And then it happens and they go, nope, I still don't get it. <laughs> so you people, if you're one of those people, send us an email, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Let us know if Blood Feast 2 was finally the uh, Herschel Gordon Lewis for you. I also, Killer Clowns is still really good. Yeah. I know it was really good 20 minutes ago, but it's still really good it's right incredible. now. It's incredible. What else do we talk about on the end of our show? Uh, I guess we talk about the other films we're doing and the saga that is the three-hour time period you're going to have to put into one of them. All right. So I think I know which uh, which double feature you we're gearing up for uh -huh. here. This is this is another one of our infamous. Uh, I guess uh, it's not quite a journey. It's not it's not Rocky Asia. Sure. It's uh, but it's more tactful than Prophecy Terminator. Well, I warned people a couple weeks ago that we wanted to try out some more dubious stuff. So this will be at least a good excuse to land us back on Double Feature has done this before, and this is the completion of our yeah. of our task, right? That's right. We're doing The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, and Godzilla Final Wars. So we're getting some, what is that third millennia that's called? That's called, yeah, it's called the Millennium. And uh, the final chapter of the Man With No Name trilogy. All right. Watch more fucking film. Bye.